Welcome to the Virtual Venture Cafe. It is our Blue Tech Innovation event, um, our virtual conference. A very special welcome to everyone who is joining us for the first time ever. First time community members, welcome to the Venture Cafe family. We gather here every Thursday. Before I get started, I would like to thank Sea Ahead for supporting uh, this conference today. Venture Cafe is a nonprofit organization and we bring all of our content free and open to the public thanks to uh, supporters like Sea Ahead who are supporting us today. And without further ado, I am happy to introduce Mark Wan, who is the co-founder and managing director at Sea Ahead. Uh, he has over 15 years of clean tech venture experience and uh, he worked in shipbuilding as a naval architect. He has been an officer in the U.S. Army Reserves for over 13 years, and with this, I am delighted he is here with us for the session, and I'm happy to pass it over to Mark. Thank you, Lilia. Uh, it's just a pleasure for all of us to be back with Venture Cafe. Thank you for hosting us today. Lilia, it was a little over two years ago when Sea Ahead, we had our Blue Tech launch with Venture Cafe in Kendall Square in Cambridge. That was a live event, um, and it was a great party. Um, so with COVID, we are virtual. Uh, there is a little bit of a silver lining being virtual. Now that we, we have virtual, we can have people coming in from all over the world, literally, both on our panels today, as well as attendees and startups. So today we are going to talk about the future of aquaculture. Uh, a lot more attention uh, coming from uh, many different new sectors, as well as your incumbents on where aquaculture is going today. Uh, and we're gonna have many different panels talking about anything from seaweed to technology. But first I'd like to just uh, emphasize and thank our sponsors uh, who have launched this with us. That's uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. We'll hear from Blaine Climbs in a bit, as well as the Cambridge Innovation Center, uh, which was one of our earliest um, partners uh, working out of the Boston Cambridge area in, uh, in startup innovation tied to Blue Tech. So, uh, who, for those who are new to see ahead, uh, uh, who are we? What do we do? We, we are a, a blue tech innovation hub and we're, we're headquartered in Boston. And essentially, we run an incubator as well as we facilitate uh, more investment in this space. And we're really looking to help catalyze this idea of a cluster, a blue tech cluster, not just in New England, but for the whole Northeast. And, and we are grateful and appreciative and couldn't get this done without our partners. And you see their logos here. So what is our construct on Blue Tech today before we go into a deeper dive on aquaculture? So our thesis is that essentially in the ocean and sustainability, there's an opportunity to really bring in venture innovation like you saw maybe 20 to 25 years ago that started with clean tech, renewable energy, later electric vehicles, LED lighting, but as well as the food and ag sector, which has gone through some large transformations and a lot of innovation uh, that started maybe roughly 10 years ago. So we believe today, blue tech could be where those two sectors are uh, 10 years ago and 25 years ago. And what, what did they have in common that we see today in the ocean economy, what's happening? Well, one is you have declining technology cost curves and that's what these horizontals are, whether that be software analytics, materials, um, internet of things, uh, digital sensors, et cetera. So that is a big plus. These are enabling technologies. The, the verticals, these are the subsectors of how we look, at least from see Ahead's perspective that we focus on. These are the subsectors of the blue economy and why were these chosen? Or why did we focus on these? A couple thoughts that one is that they have a big role to play on improving the sustainability of the ocean. Uh, the need is acute. Uh, two, uh, some of these sectors are just achieving top line growth and aquaculture is one of them. Just demand for protein, including from the ocean, just continues to increase. That's a good uh, market dynamic. Uh, or you're having a, a new wave of regulatory uh, regimes that are applying, particularly in ports and shipping that are forcing investment because they need to be cleaner, more sustainable or something. Ideally, some of these sectors we feel that there's both. There's a regulatory drive as well as consumer-driven drive, as well as just simple demand. Uh, the consumer-driven drive is, let's say, ocean plastics, where we as consumers are a lot more sensitive today and want alternatives to just uh, the plastics that we have out there today. So our view at Sea Ahead is that the opportunity at a very high level is this intersections of what we see in the horizontals as well as the verticals. Uh, so 
it it does two things. It not it it obviously involves the local incumbents, which we'll hear from today, but it also brings in some new players into into the sector, into blue tech, and that's particularly from the horizontals that you see here, and that's what we find is so exciting. And once again, the takeaway is we believe today at See Ahead that venture innovation, startups can can show up now and play a role in tackling ocean sustainability, getting a double bottom line. And the triple bottom line is also creating jobs, both STEM-based jobs as well as working class jobs for our coastal communities. A um, little more in detail about our platform. Uh, one, we do open innovation, which includes having events such as this. We wanna try and build community, try and maybe blur uh, existing silos. Uh, we always focus on the investment side, like any new emerging sustainability sector, as I mentioned, uh, the, the first movers, um, there isn't a large established uh, investment community. So we focus on building that out. And we also feel that if you're an early stage and an ideation stage and you want to work on something in the ocean and you feel that you want to do it through as a startup, uh, we feel that we really needed to create some kind of mechanism for your, a place for you to go, uh, get some mentorship and as well as some seed funding. And that's why we formed an incubator. Right now at Sea Ahead, we have 40 plus members in our two year history. As you can see quickly here that they're very diverse uh, and, um, um, and then we continue to get more members and why, why do they sign up with us? We think is one, there's a, just a desire for community in a new emerging sector or sometimes there's a specific ask on mentorship um, or help. Um, the Blue Swell the, is the incubator that we just launched with the New England Aquarium. And about in about two weeks, we will announce our first cohort. Super excited about this. Uh, I think we, we can say that we have the first dedicated um, blue tech incubator in the Northeast. And once again, this, this idea is we're trying to provide a bridge with, for those who wanna work on the ocean from an, a venture perspective. Now you have a place to go. Now you have mentors and now you have, um, uh, if, you're, if you get in, we don't have enough seats, we need more seats, but the, for the first cohort, you will also get a grant. And this is not like a Y Combinator like program because we feel well, for some of the ideas in the early stage, there isn't even any equity to take since they're not formed as companies. Uh, so look forward to uh, talking a lot more about Blue Swell. And, and, and the end goal is we really do hope that we're gonna see more innovation, particularly in the New England area tied to the ocean and Blue Swell is one way of doing that. Uh, what? The other, as I mentioned earlier, is our, our investment group, uh, Blue Angels. And so until the U.S. Navy says we can't use the word the term Blue Angels, that's what we call it. Um, and essentially, it's, just, it's, it's what it implies. We are, there are interested in, uh, angel investors in, in the ocean. And then the startups themselves have trouble um, finding uh, sources of capital because the pool of investors is not that large. Uh, from there, we're looking at creating a special purpose vehicle to do some of our own investments and as well as helping some larger entities who don't maybe either go have an expertise in the sector or don't want to go that early. Um, so uh, very excited about building out this, uh, in, uh, this investment platform, but we are happy to say that a few of our uh, companies that have presented already in our angel group have gotten funded. Uh, so the, the, this is the backdrop for the rest of the uh, afternoon. Right, and a couple points here on what we're going to talk about aquaculture. There's many different ways to approach aquaculture, right? You could look at at, um, at, at a, as a vertical fin fish, shellfish, now emerging seaweed. You could look if you're a finance person, if you're an investment community, you could be a VC person, you could be private equity. You could look at it from a from a project financing perspective for a farm, and now you're starting to see for the first time interest in the public sector. So these are public equity uh, investments, um, and that tends to usually follow the first three types of investments if you look at other sustainability sectors in the past. There, um, um, there's many different uh, subsectors that you can look at. You can look at it from, I'm only interested in technology. I'm only interested in maybe alternative feed. I'm only interested from a pharmaceuticals perspective, or you could be interested in all of them. But the, the point is that, that, that the, the, the community of aquaculture as I stated earlier, is not just the incumbents today, but you obviously have to work with incumbents, uh, is you're attracting just a large number of, of different interests, whether that be down from Wall Street 
or Silicon Valley to new corporates who said, I think aquaculture is a growth sector for us. And we like to learn more and we want to, uh, we want to play, so to speak. And in the end, uh, why is this so attractive? Uh, we're going to 9 billion people in the world. We only consume more protein. We only demand more from the ocean. So the concept of sustainable aquaculture is definitely a double and a triple bottom line. With that, I'm gonna hand this off to Taylor, who's gonna talk about how the rest of the afternoon is gonna proceed. Hey, Mark, there's one question for you in the chat. Do you want to address that first? Sure. It says, can you speak to the geographic distribution of the companies you work with? Is it all concentrated in the Northeast? Um, no, no, when we, thank you, Donna. I, I don't see the chat, so I uh, can't thank the person who asked the question. The, the, original, the original concept of Sea Ahead over two years ago was that locally in Boston and Cambridge, you see these, this trend, it's a demographic trend of these urban innovation districts, Brooklyn, Silicon Valley, parts of Northern Europe, uh, Austin, Seattle. And what we didn't see was a lot of marine and, and maritime seafood. So that's why we, we, we worked with Cambridge Innovation Center with this idea that it was originally just, there's enough to do in, in New England and how do we get more venture innovation and startups in the Boston area headquartered around a lot of that activity, which is epicentered in that Boston Cambridge. That was the original intent, but, 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 but what we found out later was that we were getting companies uh, who were signing up and being members with Sea Ahead coming in as far as Europe and as far away as Asia, uh, from shrimp farming, looking for new technology in Asia to, to uh, companies coming out of Northern Europe, looking to bring their technologies or looking to expand their platforms to go, to, let's say, be participate in the offshore wind sector that's about to explode on the East Coast. Um, so yeah, the, 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 the true story is, is that I would say more than half of our companies are in the Northeast, but I think it's just as important to say, uh, not everyone is. And, and once again, what's interesting about the blue, blue economy, aquaculture included, is by definition global. So, uh, and then, um, as I said earlier, one of the few silver linings of um, COVID is that every, we've all gone virtual, but we're going virtual. We now are able to work uh, internationally, both with, uh, from investors to corporates to startups. All right, uh, thanks, Mark. Um, sure. Yeah, so we've got some great panels the, throughout the rest of the day. Um, coming up at three o'clock uh, is our main panel um, with a bunch of really great leaders in the aquaculture industry, um, focusing on a sort of an overview um, of where the industry is at and where it's heading. Um, and then we'll break it down uh, into the different verticals that, that Mark was talking about. Um, we've got a round robin um, session with two great entrepreneurs and um, a researcher up at Bigelow Labs uh, on the future of seaweed aquaculture. Um, we're gonna be talking about finfish uh, aquaculture technology and, and also hardware. Um, and then our last round, Robin at uh, 4.45, uh, we'll look at innovations in shellfish aquaculture and supply chains. Um, so hope you, hope you can join us for each one. Um, but as Yulia said, this is also recording. Um, so you can uh, check it out at your leisure. Um, Next up, we have Dr. Kelly Lucas from the University of Southern Mississippi. Thank you, getting my screen up here for you. We able to see the screen? Thank y'all. Um, and so Mark and I got to meet each other. Um, he did some work for the University of Southern Mississippi on our blue economy um, initiative that um, has taken off down here in Mississippi. And so Mark and I have got to continue to work together. And um, uh, Mark was, when he toured our aquaculture center here was very excited. We had a whole bunch of conversations going on because we were both really excited about aquaculture, of course. And so leading into um, this conversation, I, I ask a little bit about my audience, of course. And um, he said, you're, you're gonna have some people who know, some, know a lot about aquaculture, some who maybe don't. So this is kind of gonna be a mix as we lead into, you know, how aquaculture innovation can help us meet um, the growing demands um, for protein. 
Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about aquaculture and what it looks like and why we need it. And then I'm going to talk about kind of all these innovations that are occurring and will continue to occur to propel us into the future, right? Um, so people ask me a lot when I present um, aquaculture, you know, what is it? It's, it's farming. Uh, you know, it is, it's really just farming. It's aqua farming. So breeding, rearing, harvesting of fish, shellfish, plants, algae, any other organisms from the water environment, right? So what are, what are, what does it look like? I mean, it can look like this, right? This is um, off the Hawaii and Hawaiian waters there, their state waters, blue ocean mariculture. Um, they grow a cereola, Hawaiian kampachi. Some of y'all may have enjoyed it. Um, something similar, right, off the Republic of Panama with open blue. That's cobia there, which you can see. It can look something like this, maybe. Salmon farm in Norway. You can see a lot of more um, top structure there. The cages aren't going up and down necessarily. You constantly have that kind of top view, if you would can look like this, right? Um, oyster aquaculture. And this is uh, some snapshots from across um, the United States up in Maine, Mook Sea Farm um, with the floating cages, similar to some of the floating cages we have down here in the Gulf of Mexico, um, popular on the East Coast as well. Down at Murder Point, they prefer using these um, Australian long lines. Um, they like to get out and walk along the water bottoms and, and be able to shake the cages and all that. Um, Washington, Hama Hama. Uh, these are tide tumbled. They have high tides, so the tides can do a lot of the work for them. Um, it can also look like this, right? So this is um, different versions of algae, right? Seaweed um, grown on ropes, as you can see on the top two photos. Um, you can see culture um, of microalgae here at USM, right? Then you can move these out into larger photo bioreactors. You can move them out into ponds, um, these different algae strains. Um, it can be at UNH um, where they're doing aquaponics. They're growing some, some fish, but they're also growing butter lettuce that they actually supply their cafeteria um, with butter lettuce from their um, aquaponics there. Um, it can look like recirculating aquaculture systems. So this is from USM here. Um, those fish are Gulf Red Snapper, um, and this is just a shot across um, one, of our, one of our 13 buildings here at the center. Um, so infrastructure inside, you know, closed, recirculating systems. Catfish ponds, um, also from Mississippi State, uh, up the road a little way here in Mississippi. But let's also talk about what else it can look like, right? Um, it can look like the destruction of mangroves um, to farm. Um, it can look like really intensive aquaculture that you see on the right-hand side coming from China. And it can also be things like the United States rejecting certain imports because you don't meet our standards, right? You're injecting your shrimp with antibiotics like occurred out of India. Um, so we have to kind of recognize the, the good things are going on and some of the things that may have been kind of detrimental to the environment or give people a negative view of aquaculture um, moving forward and think of ways we can improve upon that. As well. um, Mark spoke a little bit to this, right? We have a need um, for aquaculture because we have to feed a growing population. And as you can see from this, I'm sure several of you have seen it. I mean, wild Capture fisheries has been stagnant since the 80s, 90s, right? And the only growth we're really seeing in the sector is from aquaculture. And in this, I just added some numbers for you, which the top numbers, that 3 billion in the 60s there, that was um, global population. And the 5.2 is the consumption, right? That's our per capita consumption of seafood um, for individuals there. So you can see it kind of progressed to the 90s and even in 2017 with 7.6 billion population. And we're actually individually consuming more seafood. Um, so the growth in the sector is coming from aquaculture. Um, the considerations we have to think about now are we have been able to keep pace with demand. We have had these innovations along the way that have really helped us do that, whether it be cage improvements for offshore aquaculture, specific pathogen-free shrimp, which has helped expand that industry and cut down on disease and issues, vaccines um, for fish, 
sex reversal technology. Um, you can select for all females, faster growing species, as well as genetic breeding programs, really helping you select for those fish that are gonna be fast growing um, fish or selecting for oysters that may be tolerant um, of the conditions in which you're growing those oysters in. Um, but we need to produce, um, oops, sorry, more, right? More seafood, and we need to do it with a smaller footprint. Now, if you think about aquaculture in general, we already use less land area, less fresh water, and have less of a carbon footprint. But as we continue to grow to meet these demands, we're going to have to even do that and think smaller, smaller footprint. So we also have to be considerate or mindful of adverse impacts, right, to the environment. So we have to be mindful of that, um, mindful of the resources that we are using, and we have to consider climate change as we move forward. So there's a, really a lot to, to consider as we try to move forward and continue to meet this demand. I like to call it your responsible aquaculture, which Mark alluded to, kind of triple bottom line, right? Let's be environmentally, socially, economically responsible. Um, let's make sure we do this with the holistic food safety in mind, all the way from your product to the end user. Um, make sure you're considering animal welfare. Consumers really like to know the traceability aspects of where they're getting their food from, and we have to make science-based decisions as we move forward. The current outlook is great, and judging by a lot of people in this call, there's a lot of people who are excited about this. It is the fastest, aquaculture is the fastest growing food sector. I would also say a subset of that, um, seaweed has been even, um, even higher on that list. It's probably aquaculture is the fastest growing and you've seen a lot of growth um, in seaweed and in, in, in algae. Um, here in the United States, we do see a huge opportunity to increase you know, our supply of sea, seafood. We have a large marine EEZ, as you see in the, the map there on the right hand side of the screen. We also have a large land area. Um, we have some of the skilled workforce um, and we also have the ability to use some of the working waterfronts that are already available in these areas and diversify jobs. I know in Maine, um, there are several people who participate in both sectors. They, they fish when they can, wild capture, um, but then they also do aquaculture, right? So diversifying um, their income streams. One of the good things we have is technology and scientific innovations. And I know Mark talks about this all the time. We are really good at, at that, right? Um, and it's making sure we get the right people in the room to help us innovate in the way we need to. Um, in addition to that, I would say here in the US, one of the things that um, has been alluded to is kind of the environmental bo bonus. And I, I don't wanna get away from explaining that. I wanna say that the regulations we already have in place to do aquaculture in the United States ensures a lot of the safety in terms of the environment, animal health, human safety, animal welfare and all that. And so they kind of consider that those regulations are kind of already in place to help get you jump started on those best management practices. So let's really speak about aquaculture kind of innovations, right? And I, I look forward to hearing from several of y'all today because I, I think we got a lot of really good things to talk about. In terms of whenever you get started and you do these new species developments, it's kind of been a traditional way of walking them through. You're capturing your broodstock and then you're trying to maintain them and make sure their health is okay. Then you have to go through the whole spawning aspect and, and making sure you get that right. The larval culture, how do you, how do you maintain them healthy? What is their nutrition requirements? Um, what is the husbandry requirements? Um, how do you manage their health? And then all the way through grow out, right? So it's kind of a long methodical process to get there that we've been doing and we've been doing really well. And we see that continuing, um, especially for more species development. Um, in the ways of nutrition, you know, one of the things that aquaculture has taken a huge hit on in the past is you're, you're feeding fish fish, right? That's always kind of been the argument. But the, the, the amount of research and the, the improvements that have gone into fish feeds is amazing. Um, you got a lot of fish oil replacements, right? Whether it's algae, insects, yeast, bacteria that people are using. So you've seen a lot of innovations there. Um, you see some other things coming along the lines, the use of prebiotics or probiotics in foods. And so those are some of the exciting things that have occurred and continue to expand. Um, in terms of genetics, 
there's been a lot developed, right? You got linkage maps now, you got SMP markers for genotyping. You can do kind of your precise genome selection, if you would. And, you know, I don't even think CRISPR has, you know, really been touched for this area. So, so there's a lot that can be done in the genetics field instead of just saying, hey, this fish and this fish look good, let's cross them, right? There's, there's a lot of behind the scenes now that you can look at. Um, in terms of health, we've really gone away from looking at drugs and things like that. We've gone more to how do you manage the entire health of the system? How do you holistically look at this and maintain the biosecurity, the optimal water conditions, all that that really keep your animal or whatever it is, your whatever product it is you're working with from having issues, right? Like how do you have that holistic approach? Um, we've had a lot of different grow out technology advancements, cages, um, improvements in um, cages and different kinds of designs for cages, different tank systems, different ways of modifying your recirculating aquaculture system. So still a lot of potential there for those grow out um, technologies to advance. And then the other thing that we talk a lot about, and I think it's, you saw several of that on Mark's screen is precision aquaculture, right? Um, some people call it aqua technology. Um, this is all the different sensor technology that is being developed that can capture information for you, right? The things that you would normally send a person in there to constantly measure, you can have sensors that are measuring these things. Um, robots, number, numerous cameras that can give you, give you looks, right? Videos, uncrewed autonomous systems that can do these things. And just think of these sensors on all of this stuff, right? That you can then do the machine learning with we get working your way up to artificial intelligence. So a, a ton of data there that's coming in, right? The bioinformatics bioinform um, um, that will need to be stored, housed, used to make these decisions. Um, so there's a ton of ways um, at which precision aquaculture can help us advance uh, and meet, continue to meet the growing demand for protein here. I think one of the best ways to get involved is you have a bunch of diverse backgrounds and skills that come together with farmers, with your practitioners, right? The more different and various backgrounds you have in the room, that is a good way to, to start troubleshooting or see different things. Um, I give an example of um, one of the first times I walked through a building here um, when I was named director of aquaculture um, I watched this whole process and it was very methodical, right, that they were doing. It's some copepod, um, which is a feed. Uh, and I was like, have you ever thought about just automating that? That looks, you know, looks like everything's the same constantly. And they, you know, and had an engineer or somebody walks in and they would have totally seen that. And so just, just ways where other people look and see it, there's different things that can come together. So I think public-private partnerships will be huge moving forward. I think we also need to consider um, the use of different demonstration centers. I know here at um, the Aquaculture Center at USM, that's one of the things we do is we do these demonstrations for people and we work with private partners. Because if you are a farmer, if you're a private business, your system or whatever it is, your production system is tied up in producing something that you need to make money on, right? But if you want to test in advance, you need somewhere to do that. And these demonstration centers that can be used across the country can really help you test those things without you having to, with you as the, as the farmer, having to run the risk of not producing your product, right? You can have that tested elsewhere. And so I think that would be helpful. And that comes along with those public-private partnerships. In addition to that, I'm excited to see the amount of funding um, that is going into aquaculture innovation right now. Um, and that can be your traditional grants that are out there. It can also be SBIR programs. I've seen a lot more funding um, for aquaculture and different SBIR programs across USDA, NSF, um, NOAA, kind of several people that are engaged in that. Different venture capital. capital. Um, I do do a lot of tours and answer questions for several people on the venture capital side who are looking to invest and just um, may want to troubleshoot some things. And so that, that's a growing area, these accelerator programs that Mark has alluded to with investment funds, um, as well as some of the innovation prizes and stuff that are out there to help tackle some of these issues. 
Um, and so with that said, I'll take questions and I'll also say that I look forward to hearing for, from several of you that are, are gonna be speaking today. Oh, wow. Thanks, Kelly. I think we're gonna um, throw it over to Blaine Grimes at uh, the Gulf of Maine Research Institute. Um, and then after she's done, we can, um, we can get to some questions. Okay, sounds good. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Blaine Grimes. And uh, I just want to first say thanks so much for um, all of you taking the time today. This is a, such an exciting opportunity for us to get together and talk about the future of aquaculture. Um, and I also wanted to greet a number of familiar faces. I see a lot of colleagues in the room as well as folks that are new and hope to get connected with soon. Um, I am the Chief Ventures Officer at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, and we are an independent research and education institution that's based in Portland, Maine. Um, we have a mission of pioneering collaborative solutions to global ocean challenges, and of course the future of aquaculture fits right into that space. Um, so I currently serve as the head of the Gulf of Maine Ventures Group, which is a new initiative that GMRI, Gulf of Maine Research Institute, launched a couple of years ago. Um, uh, very much at the same time as Sea Head was getting off the ground with the similar idea to support the development of mission-driven business ventures and partnerships that will contribute to the modernization and really evolution of our region's maritime economy. Um, so uh, we are, I think of ourselves as an anchor and a catalyst sitting in Portland um, and the northern end of this blue economy innovation corridor that we are all collectively trying to create. Um, in our capacity uh, as a ventures group within GMRI, we have um, launched uh, two subsidiary companies that came out of the know-how of our organization uh, in an effort to begin to um, prove of concept that there's a lot to be done, not only in the wild fishery side, but on the aquaculture side. And I'm happy to say that both of those subsidiaries uh, have survived uh, this very difficult pandemic period, and um, local, we expect them to be seeking outside investment shortly. Um, I wanted just to frame up a little bit what, what Maine has to do with all of this, because I think um, it's one of those questions, I think the question came up like, are you all uh, see ahead supporting only companies from New England area? And I guess I wanted just to, for those of you who are not in New England or who are perhaps overseas um, and don't know, um, the New England area and Maine in particular is at this really unusual and amazing inflection point. Um, and in many ways, um, uh, in deference, obviously, to Kelly and what's happening at um, USM, uh, New England is having a, kind of a, an, an innovation revolution that's happening. Um, and we've become an epicenter for research, uh, business innovation, and growth in the green, so the algae, and blue economies. Um, our institution has a number of years of work experience in the wild fishery side and also on the aquaculture side. And um, we are also a leading national institution in ocean climate science and data modeling. So that puts us really in this uh, two of the verticals that you saw Mark uh, cover at the beginning of the slideshow. Uh, so in fisheries and aquaculture, uh, we have deep content knowledge and also in this notion of resilient waterfronts. Um, that's an area that we spend a lot of time and we have a lot of expertise. So we look at ourselves as content experts. Um, we have the capacity and the intention to build businesses um, and support uh, kind of the evolution of companies, especially innovative companies, um, all along the supply chain on the seafood side, um, uh, working from physics literally to fish sticks. So uh, we we love the fact that we're here in partnership with Sea Ahead, um, and look forward to uh, working with many of you. I hope to create and accelerate and ultimately fund companies in this market space. Um, that's all I have. So I'm happy also to answer any questions people might have about us and our organization, or obviously throw it back to Kelly and Mark for more discussion. I think we've got about 25 minutes until the next session. So um, if you wanna if you wanna ask a question via the chat, go ahead, but also um, I think feel free to unmute yourself and, um, and fire away. Hey, this is uh, Brian Wilson from Dura UAS and um, really happy to be here. Kind of a question, I guess, for Blaine and maybe for Kelly. You know, I'm in New York City, always looking for ways to get involved. What is the best way to approach you guys like up in Maine or where you're at to, you know, see if there are ways to collaborate as a small business with, you know, 
some of the research you're doing. We don't do research. We physically have products that we want to get out. So how do we collaborate or find ways to engage? Uh, Kelly, do you want to start or do you want me to? Okay. Um, so I guess, Brian, what I would say is the first thing is just, just what you just said, which is tell us what you're doing. And, um, you know, one of the things I think we have to offer is a deep network of uh, stakeholders and folks that um, understand the industries that you may be interested in participating in or translating what you do into the verticals that we have know-how in. So I think really it's a matter of reaching out. And part of the reason that we're doing an event like this is to make those types of connections. Um, we're early, um, the space is really nascent and there's a lot of interesting things happening at early stage. So I, I would just encourage you to uh, do what you're doing, reach out, uh, email, um, I'm easily reachable and I'm, I'm sure Kelly would say the same, uh, we'll respond. Awesome, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Same thing, Brian. I um, do calls and I, I have um, my staff down here and I hook them up with that and then different businesses um, that may also be interested. So I, I kind of play the conduit game as well. And I, I know Mark has a bunch of different um, avenues for getting people together. But I think just this, what you're going to hear from with these people on the call, that's a great networking opportunity. Yeah. And, and Brian, so, so just, Brian, you didn't, you didn't tell everybody what you do. So, yeah, so we make environmental monitoring devices, a SON, which uh, I guess I can grab them. So Brian, I, I, Brian is, work, is out of the Bronx, right on the East River. Uh, it's an example of the diversity of blue tech. He has an autonomous underwater vehicle, but it's not working for the Navy or NOAA. Yeah, yeah here's the AUV. City of New York. AUV sitting next to me here. That's really for like inspection, like infrastructure, but we make a sound, which is really what I'm excited about, which is for water quality monitoring because with ocean acidification and there's just not a lot of, uh, you know, sensors are expensive. So we built a device. This is just electronics. This is a lab unit. If you bring in samples in, but we have field units that are, you know, for discrete sampling. And then we have a version for near shore environments and it's basically allowing people to collect, you know, real time water quality data using LoRa technology so you could do hyper-local monitoring instead of like having one YSI SON and you got to go fish the data or pay for a data plan. You could have 20 of these SONs and really understand what's happening in the water column, the surface water. So that's what we do. We make uh, environmental monitoring devices. Yeah, and, and so Brian, Brian to us represents the, uh, this idea of this convergence opportunity. He's an autonomous underwater vehicle collecting data, but in the urban, for an urban setting, uh, New York City is doing a billion oyster project, not necessarily to feed us, but as a result of uh, Hurricane Sandy, right? And once again, there's just not enough data that's ironically below everybody's right under an urban waterfront. So um, a lot of different ways Brian could, could work with uh, the Gulf of Maine Institute, Research Institute, as well as with um, UR MRC and, and the Aquaculture Center down at USM. Thanks, Brian. Thank you. Uh, Taylor, there was a question that um, is it Mahan had about AI initiatives. Um, I can I can say something very briefly about one of our two subsidiaries that does have an AI component. I'm sure other people have more to add, but if that's useful, I'm happy to do that. Yeah, go for it. Mahan, did you have a specific question or? No, I was just wondering what the general um, state of affairs is in that area right now. So I don't know that I can speak to it uh, broadly. Mark, you may have something to add. I, I can just speak to one particular initiative that, um, that, that we're involved in, which is um, an electronic monitoring company, which is uh, the, the method by which uh, fisheries, wild fisheries are managed um, at sea. And there's a, an amendment that just passed um, through NOAA that um, will be requiring or uh, the 100% um, oversight of vessel um, fishing uh, going forward, some of which uh, is allowed to be electronic monitoring. Our institution has been working in that field for some time. So that means basically putting cameras on vessels in substitution for human observers. Um, so the AI component of that is how you train that um, video review software to eventually recognize a species of fish and bycatch and um, we're pretty far along uh, that um, evolution. So I think about it like Facebook for fish, kind of like we can recognize a cod or a haddock and by size there's scientific applications as well as management applications. 
that's an example of a way AI could be applied in the wild fishery side. I'm sure there's a lot um, that I'm not aware of on the, on the um, aquaculture side, for example. I'd like to jump in on the aquaculture side. Uh, my name's Tyler, I work for Innovacy, and we have a whole suite of both sensors and developing AI products. And there's sort of, they fall into two categories. Uh, we're working right now largely exclusively with fin fish, but the applications can be applied to bivalves and seaweed and, and pretty much anything. And so the first set is an array of sensors which communicate along an acoustic network. So there's no wires, which is often the fail point of a lot of sensors. They communicate uh, acoustically, so without wires to a central receiver and then populate a cloud. And so then you have these live low bandwidth data streams on oxygen, temperature, uh, chlorophyll, and you can actually integrate third party sensors into that so you can get whatever you want. And then once you have these data streams that are you know, real time, you can do whatever analytics you want on them. So you can program it to send you an alert, an email or a text message if the dissolved oxygen goes below a certain threshold, uh, same for temperature, whatever you want. The other side of what we're doing is looking at video feeds. So often within a fish pen, you would have a camera pointing at the fish and you would have uh, an operator watching that making sure the fish are feeding and when they, they slow down their feeding, uh, you would stop the feed. And so you, we can run that through an algorithm that looks at different things. Uh, one recognizes the fish and then it does an object density. Um, I'm not sure what the terms are exactly, uh, but it's really an indices of satiation. So the fish will form a feeding ball when you start to feed when they're really hungry and that registers as this object density and then as the fish dissipate, uh, they become more and more satiated. And so when we review this many, many times, we can get very good at predicting at what density the fish will stop feeding. Uh, so that's just an example of one. We have another one looking at uneaten pellets. And again, once we have these quantitative data feeds coming into a computer, we have the potential, and this is an R&D topic for next year, to take the next step and have feeding decisions automated. So instead of having a whole bunch of different feed operators, some might be new, some might be the weekend guy, um, you can have your, your expert, you know, define these SOPs for your feeding. And then it's the same protocols for every pen and all your fish are receiving the same amount of feed and it cuts off right when they're full. And it's supported by these uh, behavioral AI products as well as um, the environmental sensors, temperature, oxygen, et cetera. So it's really exciting. It's sort of a new frontier in aquaculture. It's been talked about for a while and now we're starting to see products come online. Hey, and it's great. And Marie, I see you had a question about the detection of jellyfish coming closer to the farm. I don't know specifically about that. I do know there is some technology out there that can detect um, mammals and turtles and other, it's, um, they already have the algorithm on the camera that detects that coming close. So I would think if you could do that, there is a possibility you could do jellyfish as well. Blaine, I think there was a question in there for you as well. Uh, I think the question was about bycatch and I did post into the chat. Um, okay. So um, one of the things, especially on the wild fishery side, we have is an issue of bycatch. So before it's on the vessel versus afterwards. And there's, there are quite a few uh, gear technologies. So those are you know, fairly mechanical solutions to avoid uh, different species uh, that are considered choke species or have some um, limits on their catch uh, based on their behavior. So there's, there's quite a few interesting things. Some of it's just as simple as uh, floating the gear at different levels such that it avoids or some certain certain fish avoid nets in a certain way that it's different than other fish. Some will swim up, some will swim down. So it's a pretty simple technology. I was just recently in touch with a company in the UK that has some laser technology lights that help um, actually drive uh, behavior of, of various critters. I don't know about the jellyfish angle. Um, I don't think they have this obviously the same kind of sensitivity and movement um, uh, in the way that they operate. So that's an interesting question about what might happen in that regard. 
And, and Blaine, I think uh, UMass Dartmouth has a project around computer vision for bycatch on the actual boat itself. And so maybe that goes back to the mayhem. Mayhem, your question is you know, not necessarily AI, but definitely digital, right? Of being able to um, you know, digitally capture quickly um, at least what, what you have in front of you and then yeah, and how machine reaction. learning can be applied in these, mm -hmm. you know, equations. Yeah, I mean, I think we're going to be seeing more and more of that as we see um, the evolution of um, production um, uh, scaling. We're going to start seeing, especially as you're seeing, um, you know, the, the things that are very mechanical. So as I was describing, or the very, very human uh, intensive work, you'll start to see those things shift. And I think we'll see AI introduced in a number of workflows that we haven't anticipated before. Um, and so we're just, I think we're very, very early beginning to understand how those can be applied um, in the ocean environment. Someone had a question about offshore aquaculture versus onshore farming. I wonder if, um, is Sebastian Bell on the call? Cause he might have some information if we cold call them, he might know something about that. I don't know. He's the guy that might have the stats right off the top of his head. Kelly, uh, do you might know? have to wait for the next one. Yeah. Uh, well, um, no, so I see it and thanks Kent for the question. I don't know anything specific on changing of FCR rates, right? Like in terms of whether it's different for whether it's a recirculating aquaculture system versus it's a cage system. Um, certainly in the net, whenever you see Sebastian, I'd ask that question, but thus far with most of our work, nothing's, there's not a huge dis difference between the two. Of course, that could vary by species, though, so that would be a good question. Hey, Blaine, um, I have a question. Oh. No, go ahead. Go ahead. A uh, question for you based on some discussion in the chat earlier. Um, since you're based in Maine, you know, the Gulf of Maine has a, has a rich um, history of wild of wild fishing. So could you talk about how GMRI um, sort of balances uh, the, the two different industries and your approach um, to, I guess, sustainability of both? Um, yeah, thanks, Taylor. So, you know, our, our organization uh, really works at the center of the seafood supply chain. So uh, while, while we have um, deep roots within the wild fisheries, um, one of the most important things that we think about is the overall, the long-term sustainability of our maritime heritage. And as an institution, we're interested in both the economic and ecologic sustainability of our bioregion. So um, given the work that we've done on climate, I think many people have read that the Gulf of Maine is warming at a rate that's roughly 99% faster than the rest of the global ocean. That's science coming out of our organization and um, has been widely, widely um, studied. So we see ourselves being in a laboratory, thinking about um, really a, a physical laboratory, understanding what's going to happen as our oceans shift. Um, and as they do, um, our traditional industries and our fishing industries, particularly, we're obviously heavily concentrated in lobster and Maine. Uh, we recognize that those industries will be challenged. And so one of the most um, provocative things that has happened, and actually one of the reasons we find ourselves at this center of activity, is that we have an incredibly long coastline um, that, is, that is actually largely um, unpopulated relative to the rest of the world. We, are, we still have working waterfront capacity and we have really good clean water. And so we have an opportunity to diversify from our traditional industries uh, into aquaculture. And we've seen an explosion um, in uh, oyster, aquaculture, mussel, kelp, and others uh, as those industries begin to introduce a diversification opportunity for traditional fishing industries. Um, and so, Bottom line, our, our institution is interested in how we pursue both of those activities sustainably and in, um, you know, and comfortably with one another, I guess is the best way to describe it. So in a way that we're sharing resources. Um, and I think as Kelly mentioned early, earlier, we have a number of um, uh, fishermen, lobstermen, particularly um, who have begun um, farming seaweed 
as an alternative um, or as a seasonal shift. They do that in the winter um, as an alternative to uh, or an incremental um, income stream um, after they finish their uh, harvest season on the lobster side. So we, we are seeing diversification. We are also seeing a lot of young people get into farming. Um, so it's not so much a diversification um, from traditional fishing, but actually it's the next uh, new industry for a number of young people who are interested in sort of the farm to table movement and we're in the ocean to table movement. Kelly, um, maybe this one is from Eric. Good last name, Eric Wong. <laughs> Um, and any thoughts on aquaculture diagnostics for early detection of disease? Are you all working on any of any any of that that topic? We have worked with a private company um, on some aspects of that. Um, one of the one of the things is um, amelodinium catching it early. If you have it, that's parasite, right? Um, so we've worked with a private company on some of that specifically. Um, I think a lot of what you're seeing things go to besides the early disease is right. How do you, how do you maintain optimal conditions and all that to try and prevent it? Um, but it certainly with certain diseases, the ability to detect early gives you, gives you a head start. Um, and yeah, other than the one with amelodinium recently, that's the most recent one we've worked on, but I, I do know that it's kind of a, it's kind of a hot topic as well. Yeah. I think UMass Boston, uh, Michael Telesti has been working on for oysters and you know, maybe um, up in Gloucester as well for shrimp sensors um, related to that topic, though not, but not, not necessarily the sensor itself or related is uh, we see a lot of companies looking at traceability. So that mm -hmm. is just having more precision that if someone does get sick, it, you're able to have a much more precise idea of when, where, as opposed to doing a paper trail. I, um, so that's one of the arguments as well for why why traceability through digitization is good for the, for seafood mm -hmm. in general. Yeah, and I would add that there's quite a bit of work going on. Uh, Bigelow Labs has work um, with regard to biotoxins. Obviously, the main we're very familiar with red algae and um, how that does and doesn't shut down our shellfish. Um, and so predicting. Uh, from a temperature perspective, we can predict conditions that would be, so rather than actually just waiting for the testing, you can predict times and, and needs to actually shut down um, sections of the fishery. So there's quite a bit of work. Our, our friends at the Maine Aquaculture Association um, also have quite a bit of insight into um, the biotoxin and testing um, that's required. So it, it's pretty rigorous practice um, across different sectors within the shellfish industry in Maine. All right, um, thank you everyone. Uh, thanks for the discussion. Um, I think we're gonna continue this in our next session, um, which will feature several distinguished panelists. Um, Yulia uh, entered the Zoom link um, for the next session. Um, actually, here it is again. Um, so that will be starting at three o'clock. Um, so I will see you all there. Thank you very much, Taylor, for this announcement. Thank you very much, Amari, for sharing your insights. It was such a great pleasure having you all here. Uh, feel free to reach out uh, and join us uh, for the next session in five minutes. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.